Okay, hi, uh, my name is Anthony. Um, I'm, today I'm going to talk about caching, but before I do, I just want to make sure that everyone's still awake. So we're just going to dive into some code. Um, can anyone tell me what is wrong with this code, aside from the fact that it's PHP? <laughs> There is a random cache time up there because developers love to have their applications run differently every time, don't they? Okay, uh, so a little bit about me. My name is Anthony. I am uh, an Umbraco master and MVP. I do a lot of conferences, meetups. I'm a Scrum uh, professional leader, Scrum master, and I'm also a Git Kraken ambassador. So if you want a um, a promo code, come see me after. So why do we do caching? Many different reasons. Sometimes we want to deal with limited bandwidth or availability, uh, sometimes cost. So if anyone's dealt with the Google Maps API recently, they'll see that it's gone up significantly in cost. Uh, we want probably some really fast UX, which is great. Possibly some good SEO. Uh, Google recommends that your application runs, uh, uh, your, your application responds within t 200 milliseconds. So you need to have a, a fast performance. Um, or you may want to deal with poor f performance with your application. Uh, I have some bad news for you. Caching is not the answer. You need to deal with your architecture. So a few different types of caching methodologies we're going to look at. There's DNS level so Cloudflare, for instance. CDNs, uh, you may want to output cache your HTML. You may want to output cache everything except for something, so that's donut caching. Maybe just something on the page, so donut hole caching. Maybe you want to do some method level caching or an entire service level in your application. Maybe the data layer. You may want to do some pre-indexing in your application or you may want some multi-leveled, multi-layered solution. First thing I'm going to talk about is CDNs because CDNs are a great way to um, uh, to visualize the way caching problems occur. So we'll just show you very quickly the Azure CDN creation. I hope everyone's used Azure before. If not, it's pretty simple. What you do is you What's happening? Is that running? Demo fail, video fail. Okay. So you add a name for your item. You give it a resource group. You choose a location. The location doesn't actually matter when you're choosing the, the CDN. It's weird that you need to choose it though. Um, and just choose a standard pricing tier. That's it, then you actually need to set up your endpoint. So you just click add endpoint, give it a name. So I just give it the same name. The origin in this case will be a uh, blob storage endpoint. That's the blob storage. And then you just click add. And that's basically it. That's all you need to do to set up your, um, your CDN. And here, here you see that's your CDN endpoint up there. You can take a look at some settings. Uh, you, you can set up some custom domains if you want. And there are some various compression settings for uh, different MIME types. And there are some caching rules as well. So you can cache or ignore by query string and other, all other settings in there. So this is a great no code solution for your caching strategy. So let's see this in action. I'm from Australia, so up here you can see the blob storage uh, URL. Blob storage is notoriously um, slow and unpredictable. So here you can see that it was six seconds, but then here you see it's four, almost five seconds. Okay, now here is the CDN version. 
and success. We increased the performance for our user by about 20%. It's running at under four seconds opposed to under five. Okay, so we think we've just solved a problem, a real world problem, because this blob storage was actually in Eastern Australia, but, uh, but we're in London. Let's see what happens when we want to update this file. All I'm doing here is just dropping a file in. Let's see what happens. Now we see a, a different lazy koala. But the original one is still cached. Oh no, our, our users now have the old cached file. And this is quite problematic because if you're dealing with legal documents or, or medical systems, you're going to have to do this. Go into the portal and just purge, which is horrible because you don't actually know when these things are going to occur when your end user is uploading a different file. So important things to deal with when caching, you have to know when the cache is going to time out. Does anyone know what the default timeout is for Azure CDNs? It's seven days. Um, so you definitely have to, have to know when your cache is going to time out. You also have to think, is, is stale content acceptable? Well, I mean, uh, one lazy koala and another lazy koala is not too bad, I guess, but if it's a medical document or legal document or something in real time, uh, that's quite problematic. You have to know how to clear your cache as well. So in this case, we just did it manually, but actually maybe you want to do this automatically, in which case, is this really a no-code solution at that point? Possibly not. Uh, there are some libraries out there that you can use, but then you have to do configuration and you have to deploy the configuration. And how do you get the files up there to begin with? Uh, if you're caching CSS and JavaScript files, you're going to have to do this via potentially uh, a deployment process through your CI uh, deployment. And also, you have to deal with browser cache. So if you're dealing with uh, CSS and JavaScript files, you need, to bat you need to bust that cache somehow. And typically, you do that via a query string. But then you have to add some code to your page to tell the browser that your query string needs to be different. So this is definitely no, not a no-code solution anymore. So what used to be simple, just a few clicks, you introduce all these extra problems. Next thing we're going to talk about is Cloudflare. Has anyone used Cloudflare before? A few people. Uh, for those of you who haven't, Cloudflare is a really wonderful solution. They really nailed the developer experience. Uh, it is literally just click, 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 and it just works, and it solves a lot, a lot of the problems, and you do have uh, the ability to add some, some code to do some custom ways of caching. So I'll give you a quick example of how to do page level caching. All you do is click page rules, add a page rule. In this case, I'm just going to put slash star, so I just want to cache everything, but I can cache by page or, and give a, full, give a full bunch of settings. So in this case, the browser cache is going to be four hours. Cache level, I'm just going to cache everything. And the edge cache will be about two hours. Okay, and that was it. That's all you need to do in Cloudflare to set up a cache rule. And you can be as granular as you want. You saw some different options there. So you can cache by query string, uh, by, by headers. It's actually quite nice. It's a lot more flexible than just a normal CDN, and it actually does images as well. So why would I use um, Azure CDN if I can use Cloudflare? Let's see this in action. So this is an Embraco website, the Embraco Starter Kit. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna simulate a, uh, an exception in the navigation right now. We'll see what happens with Cloudflare. Okay, so we have an error, but the live domain, that's great. No error, right? That's, that's fantastic, I, I don't see the error. But hang on, what happens if the, if the cache times out at say 
3 a.m. on a Sunday or a Saturday, and your client calls you up and says, oh no, the navigation has crashed, or some widget has crashed, and it's crashed on both, both, both instances, well, both, both domains, the Azure domain and the public one. So let's fix that error. It's three in the morning. You might be drunk. You're going to test the Azure website, it works. But the live site doesn't work. What's happened? Well, Cloudflare has cached the error. So now you have to realize, okay, um, now I have to go clear that cache again. So the problem with caching is sometimes you're caching errors as well. And even though Cloudflare is a great solution, it can actually hide your downtime or some crashed elements on your page until it's too late. Uh, and then when it does clear its cache, it's going to be a very, uh, very awkward time. Cloudflare also has limits on page rules. So it's about 100, and then you have to start paying one USD per rule. Uh, the other issue that you have to consider is you can't really cache everything all the time. So if you're dealing with a website that has logins, for instance, well, uh, you typically show like a name or maybe an email address. Well, you don't want to cache everything. You may just want to cache something on the page. Uh, you can actually consider uh, configure uh, sessions based on headers, but this is something that you need to actually build into your framework and your strategy. The next thing I'm going to talk about is Varnish. Varnish is very similar to Cloudflare in the way that it gives you granular control and it is sitting outside of your infrastructure. Uh, Varnish is a self-hosted Linux uh, instance. It's basically just a VM, it's HTTP proxy, uh, and you can configure it to any end. And here is a quick example of the Varnish configuration file. It's lovely, isn't it? Looks like it was made by Linux developers. So I've got some cookies. I don't know what any of this stuff does. Uh, yep, there's a cookie thing there. I don't know what that does. Return delivery, more cookies, some stuff, headers, and some status codes. So that's, uh, that's really great if you want the pain of dealing with uh, your own configuration file. But there are some, uh, some better solutions out there. So there, there is a service called Fastly, which will allow you to deal with your own configuration file if you want to, or you can just click around in their interface and it's similar to Cloudflare. But um, in my opinion, Cloudflare is arguably nicer. Now we're gonna talk about some code. This comes straight out of the Embraco documentation. Can anyone tell me what is wrong with this code? There's a hard-coded cache time right there. So if you have a hard-coded cache time in your application, well, how do you clear your cache? And how do you even turn off your cache? So one thing you have to remember when dealing with cache is turn, being able to turn it off is as important as the caching itself because if you can't turn off your cache, then how do you performance profile your application? And if you have this cache partial all over your website, all over your views or your partial views, then how do you know where the cache is? You're going to have to do like a find in your solution and search for the word cached partial, and then you'll get a list of all the, all the cached areas. And how do you know if they're, they're being cached in an appropriate way? What, what if you're going to use a different hard-coded cache time for each one of them? You're going to cause a few problems for yourself. So uh, we're gonna talk about output caching now. Output caching, has anyone dealt with output caching before? few nods, few no's. Output caching is quite nice. Um, basically, you add an attribute to your MVC controller, which is up there, output cache. Uh, you can set a profile name. In this case, it's called cache one hour. And you set it all up via XML. So it's very similar to before, except now I can actually turn this off via the web config. So that's great. 
uh, it just works. It, it caches the HTML that's being output by the controller. But the thing is, what, again, what happens if you want to deal with user logins? You're going to have to turn off some bits of cache for the page. So caching everything is not actually a good solution here. You're going to have to remember some things shouldn't be cached. Which brings me to donut caching. Donut caching is a solution to this. So basically, I don't want to cache everything. I just want to cache everything except something. So that donut hole right there. But then maybe I want to do uh, a, a bit more stuff. Or maybe I just want to cache everything except a whole bunch of things. Well, in this case, it becomes kind of like Swiss cheese caching. The code itself is very similar. Uh, in this case, it's called donut output cache instead of output cache. And we're basically saying, I want this action to cache everything, but just exclude me from, uh, from whatever you're caching. Don't cache me. Really similar. And it's really powerful because now you can say, I don't want to cache these things. But then I know that as a programmer, I am going to make a mistake at some point. So I'm going to forget to punch those holes on something that's really important and I'm going to get in trouble. So one of the things that I hate about this is I'm really bad at remembering things. <laughs> so, uh, so this is also not caching close to the problem. What if you're, what if you're caching, what if you're caching because of performance? Well, what, where is the performance problem? Is it deep down in your application or is it actually in this controller? And what happens when you cache this far away from the problem? Are you going to hide other problems? This brings me to donut hole caching. So this is the opposite of donut caching. You're basically caching everything. No, you're not caching everything. You're not caching anything. You're specifically caching some things, which means you can cache all these different things throughout your application. And you're essentially using output caching, but only at a action level. So in this case, all we're doing is caching bits on the page, which is quite nice. I, I prefer this method because I know that at some point I'll make a mistake. I would rather cache nothing and then be forced to cache something because I realize, well, this is a little bit slow and I've made it as fast as I can, but I want a little bit more performance out of it. So I know that this thing on my page is slow. I'll cache that. But again, this is not really close to the problem. If the problem is deeper down in the application, maybe I want to deal with that. And doing cache like this actually makes it hard to figure out where those problems are. You also have the ability to hard code cache durations uh, in this, which I'd highly, highly uh, disagree with. You should be doing uh, profiles in your web config. Let's talk about method level caching. So here is a very simple method. You've all seen things like this before. You call something that's expensive and that's a get by ID of some sort. So you see this and you think, this is really slow. I've performance profiled this. I know I'll put some cache around it so that it'll run faster. So then your method starts to look like this. You create a cache key. You're going to try to get that item out of cache. If you get the value and it's null, then then run that original expensive method, put that item into cache, maybe you want to put it in for one hour, and then return the value. Great, right? That's what we normally do. But hang on, what, if, what are some problems about this? It's no longer single responsibility. You've taken this code and you've added something else to it. Instead of just getting that value, you've now added two steps to it, checking to see if something is in cache and then adding it to cache. And then because you're doing this and because you're seeing various instances around your code where maybe this needs some cache, maybe that needs some cache, you're repeating this code everywhere. And you may do this at different levels throughout your application. You may do it in your data layer, your service layer, maybe in your controllers, maybe in some helpers, maybe in some services. It's it gets quite messy. And how do you turn this off? If, if you've just cached things for one hour, 
how do you how do you turn off all the cache so that you can do some other performance profiling? The answer is you can't. Which brings me to a way of uh, caching that I've been doing for the last few years. Uh, in this uh, in this example, I'm going to be using dependency inje injection with interfacing. It's server service layer caching, so we're going to cache an entire service. Uh, the class that I'm going to use is called a cached proxy. I like to call it an IOC cache proxy. It basically, it's, uh, it's using dependency injection and interfaces for what they're meant for, swapping things in and out. So here is an example interface, get value, and we have a service which implements that, and then we have another service, but we're calling this example service cached proxy because all it's going to do is leverage the real service but also implement the example interface. Here's that method again. Get something expensive up the top, and then down the bottom we have the cached proxy. So in this case, we're building a cache key. Dependency injection, service layer, cached proxy. We're going to go through this again. So we have a I, uh, I example service, we implement that in two ways, with one with a cache proxy. Here is that code again. So the top bit is the clean code. The, the bottom method here is just calling that method from the original service. So as you can see, the top is super clean. It's single responsibility. The bottom is just doing caching. I really love this because you can register it just like this. With uh, you can turn it on and off using a, 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 a um, an app setting, and it's just so clean. You can say, okay, if I don't want this enabled during development or maybe on your QA, you just run this. Otherwise, you register your um, your cache proxy and the cache and the original service. Super super clean. Uh, and if you want to, uh, if you want to do automatic clearing, you can do this by prefix. So in this case, uh, all the cache keys were prefixed using the uh, using the name of the class. So in this case, I can have different services. I can bust the cache of all of them, disable them, enable each one individually, and it's actually quite nice. The downside to this, are uh, it is a bit of a learning curve because people tend not to be used to doing this type of swapping of uh, things in and out using dependency injection, uh, but you actually get used to it. Your IOC um, init initialization can be a bit bloated because you do have these if statements everywhere. Uh, some methods you will only actually do pass through. So what I mean by that is some things you don't want to cache at all. So you just need to call that method. And it can feel a little bit wasteful, but it's a trade-off that you have to deal with. Uh, the other thing is there's no actual manual way to clear this Again, so you don't have to write something like, I don't know, web API endpoint or, or, or maybe even restart your application to clear the cache if you absolutely need to. Uh, but the automatic way would be when you publish something, then it, then it triggers the, the cache query. But sometimes that may, may not be enough. Maybe you don't want to, have to publish something just to clear the cache, if you know what I mean. Uh, just quickly on, um, on repository caching, don't, don't cache in your repositories. Um, it causes a lot of problems. Uh, this is code from the Embraco, uh, Embraco source. This is one of the reasons why Embraco, uh, Embraco's back office doesn't work in multiple instances. Basically, if you're dealing with cache at your repository layer, what you have to deal with is staleness of your entities. So if you have two, two instances or more, then cache is updated on one, but not the other. Some back office instances or, or whatever is accessing your data may have Sale data, you, that causes a lot of problems. So you definitely have to think of different strategies around that. One strategy you can deal with is taking it to the next level using something like Redis. So you pump your cache externally. Redis is really great, it's just a key value store. Um, you you just throw data in there and you can get it back out really quickly. That's it. The, the downside of that though is essentially costs. So um, the more the more data you, you store, the more it costs, obviously. So the lower levels, it's quite cheap, but then it can get up to like well, 1,000 pounds. But it depends on how much stuff you want to be caching. 
So very quickly, we're going to talk about multi-layer cache instances. Uh, sorry, cache uh, solutions. This is a thing that I inherited uh, a few years ago. So basically, it's a uh, it's a Danish instance. Uh, so here's a VM, uh, a website which had uh, Windows and SQL Server. So that was actually running on the browser. And you had some um, server over here, which was a PHP API running MiriDB with Danish actually installed on that um, on that machine. Now, can anyone tell me what the catch time would have been for the whole system, given the fact that you have 24 hour cache on this machine and one hour cache on this machine, with also varnish cache over here, with uh, 10 minutes cache over here, and that random cache time in PHP, which I showed you right at the beginning. What is the cache time? Around about 26 hours in total for the whole system. So can anyone tell me how to clear the cache of this entire system? The answer is there's no way to clear the cache of this whole thing. It's ridiculous. There's no way to synchronize all of these instances, well, no nice way anyway, no nice easy way to synchronize all these different systems to clear their cache at the same time. What you basically have to do is clear the cache, clear the cache, clear the cache, and then clear the cache again for all of them and try to synchronize all of them and keep clearing until you're sure that all of them are cleared. So you probably have to do this in a loop. It's actually quite ridiculous. Um, the original problem these people were trying to solve was actually inefficient database queries. <clears throat> so uh, if, if you have SQL queries and they take a long time, some people think you'll just catch it. Okay, one, one minute. <clears throat> um, so a better solution would have been to actually pre-process all of this. So I would have written, uh, would have written an importer, done some pre-processing, and, uh, and put that into a search index, and that would have solved all these problems. The, the problem about introducing more infrastructure though is the have to deal with downtime. So very quickly, uh, every, every item you introduce introduces downtime. You could get up to an hour of downtime for your whole system and your, the way you implement needs to accommodate for this. So we've briefly talked about <laughs> all of these different capital catching methodologies and what happens when you do a multi-layer solution. So my recommendations are Cache as a last resort. You have to make your applications as fast as possible. Uh, don't look at caching until you look at performance profiling. Uh, favor pre-processing instead of indexing because, uh, and indexing instead of just caching because uh, you're going to run into problems in, in live events. Uh, automatic caching and manual caching is a must. You have to be able to do these things. You have to be able to turn off your cache. Avoid caching everything because at some point you catch something that you shouldn't. Uh, cache close to the problem, don't just cache close to the user um, unless you're sure that it will be fine. Keep it simple and obvious for the next developer. Um, remember that multiple layers of caching result in multiple headaches, as we just saw before. And uh, there's no perfect solution, there's only trade-offs with your caching strategy. And that's me. Thank you very much.